Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Lloyd Nolan and Warner Baxter in The Wise Mad General. The armed forces find wartime jobs for most of DuPont's better things for better living. But rayon, perhaps, heads the list for versatility of uses. Rayon yarn goes into summer uniforms and dozens of other items of clothing. High-tenacity rayon yarn is a must in tires for trucks and bombers. But perhaps the most spectacular use of rayon is in the parachutes for fragmentation bombs. These parachutes delay impact just long enough to enable the low-flying bomber to make a getaway from the bomb's detonation. Truly a versatile, satisfactory fiber, rayon, whether it's in a dress or a parachute. Tonight with Warner Baxter and Lloyd Nolan as our stars, Cavalcade presents an almost forgotten page from our country's ever-living past to remind America that wars are won and lost and on the home front as well as on the battlefield. Our play is the story of how America all but lost her war for independence, not for lack of brave soldiers or wise generals, but because those at home grew tired, indifferent, and failed the men at the front when their need was greatest. Based on Carl Van Doren's historical bestseller, Mutiny in January, tonight's play under the title The Wise Mad General stars Lloyd Nolan as Sergeant David Herbert and Warner Baxter as Brigadier General Mad Anthony Wayne on The Cavalcade of America. Memorandum from the American soldiers of the Pennsylvania line in the fifth year of the War of the Revolution, 1781. Two, Americans on the home front in the second year of the Global War, 1943. You Americans who will never carry a gun, ride a tank, a guide a plane, you are the trustees of the freedom we won. It's yours to have or lose. Time is short. Our story is your story. It begins in the last days of the year 1780. It is cold, bone-cracking cold at Mount Campbell in Morris County, the state of New Jersey, where the men of the Pennsylvania line are quartered for the winter. Eleven regiments of Pennsylvanians, under command of Brigadier General Anthony Wayne, are lodged in the damp, dismal log huts. There were doubts in the minds of these men, distrust, and in their hearts was temptation. Thinking of the hardship of loved ones at home, that was bad enough. But when Anne came down to the encampment from the farm to plead with me, that was worse. David, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Anne, why did you come so far in the bite of winter? Come home with me, David. And the farm. How could you leave it? There is nothing to hold me. The bare earth will keep. It was your work while I was at the wars. I've been ill, David, for many weeks. There was no one to help me. I had nothing to pay. I haven't held a bit of hard money in months. You are no much food by the looks of you. Come home with me. I'm a soldier, Anne. This is our war. Oh, so I've heard time and again. War has a different face in Philadelphia. Plump war prosperous merchants, war created gentlemen and their wives and daughters flaunting their silken riches. Well, there must be men at home to supply the war. Aye, but not to profit by the war. Where is the food? The money, the clothes they promised you. Mm, Anne, we've talked about these things so many times. And have the words warmed and fed you? I shiver and shake. You're fools, you soldiers, fools. We shall no longer petition and cringe. Talk, talk, talk. You'll still be hungry, crows. Other men have gone. Come home with me. No, Anne. And I dearly love you. My allegiance is here. The men of the Pennsylvania line are through talking. Now we want it proven. Whom do we fight for and who stands with us? And how will you know, David? How will you know? Because the common men have chosen a committee to find out. And me to lead it. Is it 
done finally? Aye. It was agreed on but a quarter hour ago. Is it still thirst and hunger and our haunches in the wind? That is done with. Tonight, the sergeants meet. This may be our life or death for us. Life or death, go or stay. We've chosen our committee. We and the sergeants are one. When do they meet? The hour after sundown. Good, good. And then to waiting. Well, we shall be soldiers and men again, not slaves. See that the word is passed to all the men of the line. Tonight, the sergeants meet. Tonight. Tonight, the sergeants meet. Tonight, Tonight the sergeants meet. <laughs> Gentlemen, General Anthony Wayne. That is, gentlemen. <clears throat> gentlemen, the time for warning is past. The time for high-sounding but empty promises to the men is over. Captain Benton, when does the board of sergeants meet? Within the hour, General. And we shall know what they plan before the night is up. We await only the word from you, sir. Word for what, Colonel? To place every one of the 11 sergeants under arrest. On what charge? That they plot disaffection, sir. Perhaps, Colonel, perhaps. But let us remember that the sergeants were elected to speak for the men of the line. As a committee, they have a right to meet and present their demands. They, they just follow the tradi tradition of the American colonies. Sir, if we cannot meet the demands of the men, they may join with the enemy in New York. Captain Benton, our cause has walked over that tight rope many times in these five years of war. Recall West Point, Massachusetts, Connecticut. The threat passed in those places. It may come down on us here, sir. Enemy agents have spread handbills through the camp. The men are promised forgiveness, food, money, and clothes if they desert and join with them. We must take immediate measures. I prefer to believe that our men are loyal. Uh, what measures do you suggest, Colonel Butler? Ball and powder will quickly dissuade these men. Have we so much as forgotten our cause that we can speak of shooting down our own men? Do we no longer oppose the practices of autocratic Europe by shooting, hanging, and flogging or the answers of authority to the just demands of the citizens? Your pardon, sir. But if the line rebels, our citizenry will hold you at fault. True. They need a scapegoat. But, gentlemen, the fault in this matter is with the very citizens at home. They have forgotten that this war is also theirs. In the past 46 weeks, the Pennsylvania line has been reduced to dry bread and beef for our food and to cold water for our drink. Old worn-out coats and tattered linen overalls are the only protection our soldiers have against the winter's piercing cold, the drifting snows and the chilling sleets. These men have now served their country for nearly five years. Poorly clothed, badly fed, and worse paid. Why, they haven't seen a dollar in the way of pay for near 12 months. <laughs> I marvel constantly at the patience and faith and endurance of our soldiers. Yes, Lieutenant. Sir, the sergeants are assembled at the first hut of the 5th Regiment. Guards have been placed about. Any orders, sir? Only one at this moment. Patience. discussion to this moment. These will be our demands, that all monies and bounties owing to us be paid over, or that immediate provisions be made for same. In hard money, Davy, not Aye. the soft, worthless uh, printed stuff. Aye, that will be stated, Maloney. Go on, Davy. That all men who enlisted for three years be mustered out of the line to go to their homes or to re-enlist in the line as they may choose, and that we be supplied regularly with the food and clothes necessary to keep ourselves as men and soldiers. These are our demands. Are we all agreed? Uh, I, I should like to speak on that point. Sergeant Cooper. The men of the 8th Regiment hold that if our demands are not met, we go with the enemy. Aye, if we can do no better. No, no. They promised us a pardon, money, and clothes. Men, men. What we now are about to do is not of our own wishing or making. We've given up our homes, our farms, our families. And received in nothing in return but promises. I say that now we must march on those at home who promised us and demand they make good their bargain. Aye, we'll be called be traitors. traitors. Groups will be marched against us. The men of the Continental Army will stand with us. We're not traitors. We're loyal soldiers asking our promised rights. We are not Arnold. Aye, that's true, man. Sergeants, I speak for joining with the enemy. What have we to gain by sitting here starving in these cold, filthy huts? What are we going to do? It goes on like that for nearly three hours. One side, then the other, pro and con. Then at last there is an agreement. Go on, Dave, go on. As agreed upon, the firing of the rocket will signal the men to assemble on the parade ground. The men to carry their arms, Sergeant Herbert? Aye, aye. All the arms and field pieces are to be taken, but the men are to march peacefully and in good order. No man is to fire unless fired upon. We're not making war on our officers 
or our fellow soldiers. Our men have no food or money to buy it. How shall they be provisioned? I propose that we ask for food from the farmers along our line of march. They'll stand by us. But no man is to steal a forced provision from these citizens. We must not make an enemy of one of them. It is now shortly after nine o'clock. The night is cold and moonless. General Wayne is waiting for our decision. Yes, Lieutenant. The rocket, General. The rocket's just been fired. The men are assembling on the parade ground. Gentlemen, it is here. Lieutenant. Hi, General. Go to the parade ground immediately. Order all commissioned officers there not to fire on the men or in any way try to hold them. Yes, sir. General, General, all officers are shooting at the men. Fools. Fools. Shall we go out there, General? Wait, wait. All is quiet now. Uh, Our troops show better judgment than my officers. Wait, listen. The men are marching off. Captain Benton. Aye, sir. Have three horses brought here immediately. Aye, sir. Gentlemen, in less than a half an hour, those men will reach the forts in the road leading from Mount Kemble. If they take the right fork, they go to Princeton, to Trenton, and finally to Philadelphia to present their demands before the Congress and the Pennsylvania Council. The left fork leads to Elizabethtown. That is the road to New York and the enemy. Colonel Butler? Yes, sir. Colonel Stewart, ride with me. These men must not take the Elizabethtown road. If it means my life, they must not march toward the enemy. Company! Halt! Who is empowered to speak for these men? If it pleases the general, the board of sergeants speaks for them. Is there no one man? The board has commissioned me to speak in the presence of these two sergeants, sir. Your name, sergeants? Herbert of the 11th. Williams of the 1st. Maloney of the 5th. Thank you, thank you. These gentlemen are Colonels Butler and Stewart. What do you wish with us, General? You would order the men back to the camp. Well, your pardon, sir, but the men of the Pennsylvania line have bound themselves to march off and march we shall. Are you aware of the consequences? We are, sir. Shoot them down! Shoot them down! Quiet! Quiet! General Wayne, our men are fierce with their great weariness. We have far to march. One moment. There is still time to lead those men back to camp. We march as we have planned. Our business is no longer with you, General. Sergeant, if you're determined to lead your men to Elizabethtown, you, you'll have to shoot us to clear the road. Sir, we are burdened enough as we are. Drummer! Hi, Sergeant. Strike up! Oh, and... Hurt! General! General! The men are taking the road to the right. Aye, the Princeton Road. Aye, Colonel, but, but they are still our men and loyal. On Wednesday, the 3rd of January, 1781, the Pennsylvania line made camp at Princeton. General Wayne and his staff arrived. An orderly line of pickets and guards separated the men from their soldiers and the townspeople and the officials. The demands of the men had been sent by Wayne to the Honorable Joseph Reed, president of the Supreme Executive Council of Pennsylvania. It is now the evening of Saturday, January 6th. Jeremy, our drummer boy, is on watch outside the tent. There we saw a million men as thick as hasty pudding. Good evening to you, lad. Who are you? Quietly, lad, quietly. What do you seek? You bear a message, lad. Take us to the commanding officer. Who are you? Time runs short, lad, and tongues run long. Take us to your commanding officer. Yes, what is it? We bear important matter, Sergeant Herbert. Is the enemy on the way, Mr. Mason? No, Sergeant. I bear this paper from Sir Henry Clinton. Sir Henry Clinton? Yes, in command of His Majesty's forces. A message to the sergeants from Sir Henry Clinton with an honorable proposal. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presenting The Wise Mad General, a story of the war which America almost lost because the people on the home front 
forgot that the war was also theirs. Our play stars Warner Baxter as General Matt Anthony Wayne and Lloyd Nolan as Sergeant Herbert. 2,000 Continental soldiers still loyal to the cause of freedom, but desperate from hunger, penniless, half-clothed, are marching toward Philadelphia to present their grievances to Congress. As our play continues, an emissary of the enemy has just brought a message to Sergeant Herbert, the leader of the sergeants. Hmm. Well, it is signed by Sir Henry himself, all right. Go ahead, Sergeant. Read it. By messenger, an honorable proposal. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania troops have been defrauded of their pay, clothing, and provisions. That's true, isn't it, Jeremy? Aye, Sergeant. And if you lay down your arms and return to your true allegiance... You'll be pardoned and paid the money due from Congress without expectation of military servants, except it be voluntary. Well, that's a very handsome proposal, Mr. Mason. Aye. You should be suitably rewarded, but unfortunately... Well, we ask nothing, Sergeant. Our pay awaits us in New York. Well, then that's a pity. Why, sir? Because you'll never return to claim it. Craig! Aye, Sergeant. Call the guard and secure these men. Sergeant, we come as friends to your men. Uh, Craig, take these men prisoner. Jeremy... Rout out the sergeants to assemble here at once. So, Sergeant Herbert, you've been urged and flattered to join with the enemy. Huh? This paper speaks for itself, General Wayne. Aye, Sergeant. Why have you and Sergeant Mahoney uh, brought them here to me? To prove our loyalty, sir. It's the will of the Board of Sergeants. There's a sword over our heads, eh? If your demands are not met with, you join with the enemy? <laughs> it's... It's very strange, sir, that we should have more faith in you and Mr. Reed than you have in us. Sergeant, you have led the men of the line into an action that many call treason. Our misery, poverty, and bareness forced us, but not to treason, General. We are not and never will be Arnold. Those are merely words, Sergeant. Time will prove us. What if the enemy marches even tomorrow into New Jersey? Then we shall oppose them at every expense of our blood. Well spoken, Sergeant. Well and truly meant, General. All right, now about these two prisoners. What does the Board of Sergeants propose? We turn them over to you and the Pennsylvania Council, sir, to be dealt with as spies and emissaries of the enemy. Sergeants, President Reed of the Council is proceeding to Trenton to discuss your terms. Tonight's matter will speak in your favor. In recognition of your loyalty in bringing these men here, I promise you, in the name of President Reed and the Council, 100 gold guineas for the regiment. Thank you, General, but... That was not our purpose in coming here. What is it, Sergeant Maloney? Well, as you know, sir, the board has been promised an early meeting to consider our demands. The men grow restive. How much longer must we wait? Tell the sergeants and the men that at daybreak I go to meet with President Reed. General Wayne, forgive my saying so, but... Uh... Your solicitude for these uh, mutineers is remarkable. Mr. Reed, I am a soldier. I'm aware of what these men have done, but I also am aware, and General Washington concurs, that, that these men have been moved to act after their grievances have gone to extremities that would not be borne in any army. Yeah, time is short, General. There are several pressing matters to settle. First, the hundred guineas you promised for turning over the spies. Mm -hmm. Do you disapprove, Mr. Reed? You were a trifle too fast in promising so large a reward. I gave those men my word, sir. I cannot and will not authorize this sum. It is too large. Our finances, my dear general, do not admit. What word shall I give the sergeants? I shall deal with these men myself, in my own way. And uh, when may the men expect you at Princeton, sir? I do not propose to go to Princeton. It would be more fitting to have them come to me here in Trenton. Should they refuse to come, sir? Tell them there is food stored for them. That ample clothing is now on the way from Philadelphia. That will fetch them. <laughs> All right, I shall convey this information. Just one more item, General. It might speed our negotiations if you were not present here. Sir, my orders from General Washington are to keep with my men. I shall do nothing other. was on the 10th day. The men of the Pennsylvania line were in Trenton. The board of sergeants had met with President Reed and then reported to the men. This morning, they hanged the spies we took to them. What are the gold guineas that were promised? Yes, yes. What are the, gold the board of sergeants has agreed not to ask for the reward. Why? 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 
Because we turned the spies over to General Wayne for the love of our country and not for gold. Reed's tongue wheedled us out of our gold. Sergeant! What is it, soldier? I'm with the board on this matter, but it's small. What of our money, our clothes, our terms of enlistment? Oh, yeah. Well, these matters have not yet been agreed upon to the board's satisfaction. Well, do we stay here or do we march again? The board of sergeants is for staying. For how long, sergeant? Until the board decides that the men of the Pennsylvania line can gain more by going. Oh, days peeled off and drifted away. Some money finally arrived and more was promised. Some clothing was distributed, but more was needed. Enlistments were reviewed and adjusted. Now nearing the end of the 15th day, a day of cold and rain and sleet, the Board of Sergeants meets. Soldiers, members of this board, our work is now almost done. Sergeant Herbert, are you content with the settlement? Well, many of our terms have been met. And for the rest, we have promised. Yeah, yeah. At the start, you were one of the strongest. Have you cooled down so quick? Have you? I am as much concerned regarding the needs of the line as you are, Sergeant Maloney, or you, Green, or you, Cooper. And why do you speak for those who say put an end to it? Is it because they are in the majority? It's only because I know that now the soldiers of the other colonies have nothing more or better than we have. I I I and more. I Without treason or treachery... We stood together as free men before those in authority and asked for redress of our grievances. We've awakened our citizens to the war. Now we can support... Sergeant! Sergeant! Oh, yes, what is it, man? Come forward. Orders are come from General Washington to General Wayne. The Pennsylvania line is needed in Virginia to join with the troops under Lafayette. It must be done at once. Has the line been told? Aye. The men gathered to hear the board's decision. Our thanks to you, soldier. Good day. Sergeants. Sergeants of the Pennsylvania line. Five years ago, we came together for freedom. That freedom means life to us. But it's not yet ours, and it won't be ours until we stand together. Many of us may never live to see that freedom, but it will come. And when it does, those generations who will be born to it may remember that freedom comes not by wishing, but is hard fought for and dearly bought. Until a moment ago, we were forgetting the war. Now it is once more with us. The men are waiting for our word. Shall we march and fight again for freedom? Let each member of this board speak for himself. I say march. Aye. 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 We march. We march. We march. We march. Pennsylvania line have one substantial agreement to a majority of their demands, and inasmuch as out of loyalty and devotion to our common cause, they have of their own free will foregone several additional demands, which were nevertheless considered by me and by my officers as clearly justified and right, I therefore, as Brigadier General of the Pennsylvania line commanding, do hereby order that no man is to be brought to trial or censor for what has happened on or since New Year's Day, the year of our Lord, 1781. DuPont thanks the stars for this evening's performance, Lloyd Nolan and Warner Baxter, for their part in recreating for Americans of today this picture from the past. A picture that points out the necessity for giving, saving, working, and the supporting of our armed forces until final victory is ours. Our stars will return in a few moments. Meanwhile, here is Gain Whitman to tell how a new development in paint chemistry is protecting precious military and naval equipment. In the great shipyards of the Atlantic and Pacific coast, turning out battleships. In the inland shipyards of the Middle West, where the landing ships for tanks and infantry are made, all Navy craft under construction are first painted a bright yellow. In airplane factories turning out fighters and bombers too, all interior and exterior surfaces of the planes are protected with a yellow paint, zinc yellow. The reason is a chemical reason. Air contains moisture and oxygen. Exposure to air causes corrosion. For more than 10 years, DuPont chemists worked with technical experts of the Army and Navy to develop protective coatings for fighting equipment in every field of action. 
In the old days, red lead was virtually the only pigment used to safeguard metals against corrosion. But it was found inadequate for the protection of the newer light metal alloys used in planes. So chemists went to work. Thanks to chemical research, the problem was solved by zinc yellow. Not only does this pigment afford greater protection against corrosion than any other, but it has made possible the development of faster drying finishes, thereby speeding production. Dry colors or pigments, of which zinc yellow is an example, are products of modern chemistry not many people know about. They do enter your home just the same in many ways. They give the linoleum on your floor its soft glowing colors. They tint the paint on your walls and color your wallpaper. They brighten the comic papers and illustrations in the magazines you read. They color your food packages and the labels on cans. They give the bright colors to the finish on your automobiles. Now, in wartime, they are doing a most important job. Mechanized war uses up vehicles, whether they are gun carriages or jeeps, at an appalling rate. Landings through surf, jolting accidents, enemy mines and shells wear out and destroy these wheeled tools of war by the thousand. Sometimes as much as half of the equipment put ashore is wrecked or damaged. All of this puts a heavy premium on protection against rust and corrosion. It is a destructive force, too, and every piece of metal which we safeguard through the use of protective finishes is one more advantage for our side. May end the war one hour, one minute, one precious second earlier. Rust and corrosion sign no peace treaties. Protecting metal against their ravages is the wartime job of these pigments that are numbered among DuPont's peacetime, better things for better living through chemistry. And now here are the stars of this evening's cavalcade, Warner Baxter and Lloyd Nolan. And I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Warner Baxter and myself. We both feel that tonight's play is of real importance to every American. That wars can be lost at home, too. Soldiers aren't enough. Uh, and a timely warning, too, Lloyd, uh, in these days when we're likely to be over-optimistic. You know, history can repeat itself now. Let's not almost lose this war by failing to support our men at the front. Uh, let's back them up in every possible way, with giving and with letters, with bond buying, and most of all, by production at home for those at the front. Next week, the Cavalcade of America will bring you one of Hollywood's top flight stars, Brian Donlevy, in a role tailor-made for his brilliant portrayal of a man of action, deep emotion, and quiet humor. Our play, Navy Doctor, is a dramatic close-up of the medical corps in action against a background of one of the great naval battles of the war, and is based on the actual personal experiences of Commander Charles F. Flower, Medical Corps, United States Navy. DuPont invites you to join Cavalcade's audience again next Monday evening when Brian Donlevy will be starred in Navy Doctor, a story of a struggle between life and death aboard a doomed United States cruiser in the Battle of the Solomons. Tonight's play was adapted by Milton Wayne from Carl Van Doren's book, Mutiny in January, published by Viking Press. Tonight's musical score was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. This is James Bannon sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Cavalcade of America came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.